If you want this podcast free of ads, follow us now on patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you there? It is podcast time. John is sitting opposite to me here and he's talking to me about J.R. Ewing. <laughs> this is the uh, who shot J.R. moment. Who shot J.R. No, but it's all his feeling and dealing. That's oh, I know, like, it's true. <laughs> I love when, 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 when Shan's drinking, I usually call her Sue Ellen. <laughs> Oh, God, I feel an edit going on there. <laughs> now you have to leave that one in. <laughs> anyway, how are you, Ed? I'm good. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Good. In our unseasonably warm, <laughs> I've I've been burnt to a tinter. Yeah, I've yeah, yeah. I, especially when you're whizzing along on your Vespa. Oh, no, it's it's very, it's Vespa weather. You get the wind burn, the wind and, burn the sunburn. and the sunburn. But chances are it'll be put back in the barn very soon. <laughs> I'll be taking that again in June. Well, what's rocking your world? There's a few things going on. And there's one thing that I, I, I want you to explain to me. Right. I, I was reading that story about the REITs. Oh, yes. The Real Estate Investment Trust. Yes. Explain REITs to me. And how are they different to okay. other investments? To other investments. Okay. Well, this is, the story is, this is a, is a company called Hibernia REIT, which has just been sold for 1 billion euros. Yeah. So this is not an insubstantial trade. Indeed. And of course, the property people will be sort of claiming that this is a great, great deal. Now, maybe it is, but let's explain what happened. Yeah. Because if you follow the money here, a REIT is a real estate investment trust. I'll tell you exactly what that is in a minute. Okay. And these guys have sold out their REIT at a very significant premium to where the REIT was trading. So it's a traded vehicle. I'll explain the whole thing to you. But I wanted to start 2005. So 2005 is the year... (laughs) Going back in time. 2005 (laughs) is the year when the Irish banks ran out of deposits, right? Right. So basically the Irish banks ran out of money in order to lend to everybody. So they had to borrow money elsewhere. This is also the year, right, between 2005 and 2008 when everything crashed, okay? Mm -hmm. Bank of Ireland, for 160 years... They lent out as much as they had done in the previous 160 years in three. Wow. Right? Really? So that's how mad the Irish banking system was, right? Yeah. They're all lending, right? So imagine you are a developer, right? And you knock on the door of one of the big banks back in 2006, 2007. And yeah. you say, can I have 100 million euros to buy this building? In used notes. In used notes, yeah, exactly. exactly. In filthy <laughs> fivers, right? And the bank says, that's fantastic. We'll give you 100 million euros. Uh, don't worry about it. We just, we, we'll give it to you tomorrow. And what the banks then do is they borrow the 100 million euros from some other bank, okay? Right, yeah. And then they give it to you and they charge you a premium. Yeah. And then the person who does that gets a bonus. Right. And of course, therefore, the whole bonus structures were so crazily joined us towards overlending because everyone's getting paid, yeah. right? So then you've got your building. Bank of Ireland or AIB or whatever it is owes another bank 100 million, right? And everyone's happy right. for a few months. Yeah. It's prices keep going up and up and up. And everyone thinks they're geniuses because the building goes up and now it's now worth 110 million. Yeah, yeah. So everyone looks right. And then the crash comes, right? And now the building's worth 40 million. And you, the developer, goes bust. Yeah. You hand back the keys to the bank and you say, sorry, lads, I've no money, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the bank now has an asset worth 40 million but it has a debt corresponding to that asset of 100 million. Yes. And the other bank now is panicking that it won't get paid, so it calls in its debt. Right? right. So therefore, the Irish banks are about to go bust. Yeah. So what the government says is, okay, banks are going to build. What do we do? And again, it's, do we, we have a choice between, as I've said before, having a, a recession of 15% unemployment or 50% unemployment? Because if the banks go bust, everyone lose everything. Yes. So the government says, okay, we're going to put... The difference between the 40 million and the 100 million, which is 60 million, on the national debt. Right. right? That's what they did in order to prevent the banks going bust. In other words, on us. On us, right? right. But the choice was, and I, you know, I've always said around that, that there was never a choice between good and bad. It was always between bad and worse. That's always in a crisis. You don't okay. have your choice is never between, oh, this will be really good and this will be really quite bad. It's always, mm. this is going to be bad and this is going to be worse. So then in about 2012, 
those assets are trading at 40 euros. And the banks need to sell those assets, right? They need to get rid of them, okay? Yeah. To get 40 euros, okay? Yeah. Or 40 million in this case, right? So they sell them on. But at that stage in Ireland, nobody had any money, right? Right. So who bought them were outside funds who bought assets that should be worth 100 for 40. Right. Right? Bargain and bin. Bargain bin for them, right? Yeah. And then they waited for those assets to rise in value, which they have done, right? Yeah. But, but all those people who bought those assets were like foreign investors, right? Speculators, right? Yeah. Who didn't have any interest in being in Ireland for the long term. Because they said, okay, we're, we're buying this because it's really cheap. Yeah. We really want to get out it's of it. Just, it's flipping it. Yeah. yeah. So, therefore, a real estate investment trust is an entity that buys those debts, right, that have been defaulted on. The difference between the default price and the actual price the taxpayer takes, right? Mm -hmm. They buy those debts. But how do they buy those debts? They buy those debts by issuing shares. So that's the trust, right? Okay. So they issue shares, and then individuals buy those shares. Right. So that real estate investment trust bought the defaulted debt off the speculators, then waited for those asset prices to rise. Now, therefore, a whole host of individuals owned those who bought the shares, right? Yeah. Now, for the last couple of years, those real estate investment trusts have been trading not particularly well. So now what the owners of this place, Hibernia, are selling that to a Canadian fund. Right. So bizarrely, a story that started with Irish banks lending to Irish developers financed by foreigners is ending with foreigners owning the very assets that the Irish banks defaulted on. Right. That's it. Wow. That is that is it in a nutshell. The West Lower will be very happy. And 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 Tarquin will be happy, he'll be paid. All the brokers will be paid. So we, we, All the we, we, paid. we 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 subsidize. So the rich guy is subsidized by the little guy. Oh man. And that's how the whole thing worked. Yeah. So you know when you think about so that's the idea of following the money around the place to see. Where did that come from? Who paid for it? Where's the where's the difference between the, yeah, the yeah, bought price yeah, yeah. and the default price? All that sort of thing. And now you have a situation where you have a payout for a small amount of individuals sold on to a foreign fund. And Irish property is now owned by foreigners. And that's the end game of the whole thing. And that is the story of the wheat, John. Now, if you were down in the West Lower... And it was rugby season or it was Leinster season. I presume Leinster are playing quite soon, aren't they? You're asking the wrong guy. Yeah, here. I know, but they, they do play. So yeah, if yeah. you're if you're in the West Lower and it's Leinster are playing, uh, it'll be like Lions and uh, there'll be lots of clinking of glasses. Oh, yeah, totally. There'll be clinking of glasses yeah. and... Plastic glasses, actually. Plastic glasses <laughs> and Tarquin will be gave a few quid because he obviously arranged it as well. Yeah. He's back in the sheepskin. <laughs> Hip flask. Collars up. Collars up, <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... So yeah, okay. So yeah, I, I I've got my head around that, but I'm not too happy about it. At no, the same well, you time. shouldn't be. I mean, you should. This is basically was what the way the way in which economic cycles redistribute wealth from the wealthy to the even wealthier. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically the way it's yeah, going. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But there's something coming down the track, John, which I find very interesting. Go on. I think we are in for a massive, massive scrap between the government and small and medium-sized businesses. Oh, right. Go on. In the next couple of months, right? Yeah. And everyone's trying to manage this and nobody's talking about it. But when COVID started, the government introduced the thing called warehousing of VAT. Yeah. So what they said to lots of companies is, don't worry about paying your VAT today. We're going to give you a warehousing scheme that you've got to pay your VAT back when everything goes back to normal. Mm. Right? Yeah. So hundreds of millions, sorry, billions of euros of deferred VAT payments has been what they call warehoused. Right, okay. So if you imagine a warehouse, you actually put something into the warehouse, yeah. right? And then you close the warehouse. Yeah. And then when you open the warehouse, the stuff is still in the warehouse and you get to use it. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? But that's not what happened. So companies said, that's great, we'll warehouse our VAT, but they all spent the money. The money's gone. Nobody has it. They have right. maybe portions of it. Now, if the government... Well, you don't blame them for spending it because everyone's backs were to the wall anyway. And, and there was no survive. business. Yes. There was no business. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what's happening now is the government is now trying to get the money back. It's going to announce it quite soon. Right. If they try to get the money back from small businesses, there will be mass 
mass bankruptcies in this country. Yeah. If they give an amnesty, yeah. it'll be seen as the government facing, favoring business and not workers. So they're in a total bind. But not every business. I mean, I've been paying my VAT all the way through as well. So you know, I wasn't warehousing. <laughs> and I didn't have a warehouse to put well, it in. Exactly. But lots of businesses do. So I would say... I did it under my bed. <laughs> You should have had an amnesty. Do you remember the tax amnesties? I used to love them. Remember I told you yeah, the story yeah. about the tax amnesties in Ireland? <laughs> and, and you earned a fortune. And everyone would say, uh, oh, no, no, there's no tax evasion in Ireland, no tax evasion at all. And then we'd have an amnesty, and there'd be like buckets of money would come in. <laughs> this is when in the central bank when the two Yanks and the IMF yeah. were sitting there, and your man says, and the IMF is quizzical, so he's like, I don't think you had tax amnesties. And your man says, listen, son, the laws of economics stop in Hollyhead. <laughs> so the big showdown coming up. Right. And, and, the and, state... And and the business community. Question then, that 15 billion extra or unexpected. Unexplained, <laughs> unexpected tax, ta windfall. Windfall that we have. Did that include this, that, no, or not? No, so what is going to happen, I think, is this government is going to issue an amnesty on commercial VAT payments during the pandemic. Right. Uh, and the reason it's going to issue an amnesty is because I think if they go after all this fat, loads and loads of companies just don't have it and they will go to the wall. Because yeah. if you talk to a lot, a lot of Irish companies, their margins are really quite tight now because the cost of everything's gone up. Yeah. Right? And the cost of labor has gone up, cost of housing's gone up, cost of land has gone up. And yeah. of course, now the cost of energy has gone up. Yeah. So, really tight margins at this stage. I mean, there's loads and loads of hauliers now, John, who are actually getting out of the business. Because they can't afford the diesel. Yeah, yeah, you know, they, yeah, they just yeah. can't. Some of them can't get the diesel. Some of them can't afford the, the diesel. So, I was actually the government would be crazy to impose this right now. I mean, when you talk about hauliers, I heard a thing recently about the cost of transporting a container from, say, Asia to here. It mm -hmm. used to be a couple of grand. Now it's ten to fifteen grand. Yeah, it's gone through the roof. So all the these roof. costs. Yeah. So that's why that's why we're getting inflation is because all these supply issues are all clogged up, and on top of that, of course, you have the energy increase, and now on top of that, if you're a small business in Ireland, the government's coming looking for your yeah. VAT that you've put in the warehouse, but you didn't put in the warehouse, you <laughs> spent. So the next time, John, moral of the story is, before we talk about something else, the next time somebody says, it's in the warehouse, <laughs> it's not in the warehouse. Mac, you know, on our last podcast, we were talking about oil prices and, you know, and, and Russia demanding oil payments in the ruble and stuff. And you, you were talking about the ruble and collapsing and all this. I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, how come Russia or the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc countries, how come there wasn't a ruble zone in the same way as there would yeah. have been a euro zone? Because that would have bound them together even, even tighter. Even tighter. And there was even a French, you know, the French franc zone. Do you know the French franc zone? Most of West Africa used the French African franc. Did they? And the French left their colonies, yeah. but kept them tied to France using finance. Oh, I right? didn't know that. It's a fascinating question about the ruble, the Soviet Union, that type of economy. If you'd ever traveled in any parts of the former Soviet bloc, the most extraordinary thing was trading black market dollars for whatever currency it was, rubles. Mm. Uh, you would, the official exchange of it was one to one, one dollar to one ruble. Yeah. The unofficial exchange would be about 20 to one. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So that meant that the actual currency was a complete, it's a fictitious currency. I remember I explained to you a couple of weeks ago that the way in which the oil oligarchs got their money out was they traded oil in the West for yes. hard currency, but they paid their people in rubles and they pocketed the difference. Yeah. That was the, that was the way. But the reason they didn't do is it was very bizarre. They tried to preserve the notion of independence. So the Soviet bloc would be here and then the Warsaw Pact would be its, its NATO. Yes. And those Warsaw Pact countries would be Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Poland... Romania, Hungary, those ones, right? Yeah. Not Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia always was independent. So Yugoslavia, Tito was such a hard bloke, he said to Stalin in 1948, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. He actually did. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine that. He was a bit of a dude, actually, Tito. Tito was a dude. Tito, yeah. and, and the Yugos, the Yugos were meant to be, everyone thought they'd go straight into the Soviet bloc. Yeah. But they didn't. 
And they actually said to the Russians, well, if you want to have a scrap, scrap us. Right. Because, and the, Russian, and the Russians were it. afraid. Because the Germans, the extraordinary thing about Yugoslavia, the Germans lost more troops per head in Yugoslavia than they lost in Russia. Oh, really? Yeah, they got their arses kicked by the partisans. And the Russian Stalin saw that and said, look, yeah, we leave them be. <laughs> we leave them be, those kind of Serb Croat guys. Yeah, yeah. My mates, <laughs> we leave them be. They're a bit hardcore for us. Like if you're, if you're, imagine you're too fucking hardcore for Stalin. <laughs> right. So that was the Yugos. But anyway, so, so the Russians did tie them in, but they wanted to keep this sense that they're independent. Yeah. It was an illusion. Though. Complete illusion. Yeah. But for all things, the Russians did involve themselves in this huge amount of barter. Now, this is interesting. So the Russians would give you, for example, a Russian satellite state like Mozambique or Angola or Cuba being the great example. Right. right? So they'd buy sugar from Cuba and in return have oil, give them oil. Okay. It was always barter. There was never any money exchanged. Yeah, yeah. And that's how, so for example, if you went to Cuba before the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba was like Mecca. I yeah. mean, because they, they had everything. They had, they had, there was some pretty basic stuff, but they had energy from the Russians and they traded coffee and sugar with the Russians. Yeah. Right. And cigars. And cigars. Exactly. Yeah. And the Russians, the Russians gave them energy and pretty much old ladders. So if you ever go to Cuba now, it's full of ladders. Yeah. yeah they were yeah. all traded by the Russians. Right. But that's what there was a ruble zone, but it was never really an economic zone like the Euro and the differences, right? The Euro came about, this is the interesting thing, because of Russia. So the Euro was a project that French bureaucrats really quite liked, but nobody took it seriously, Yeah. right? And then, of course, what happened is the Berlin Wall comes down and Helmut Kohl, the German prime minister at the time, says, okay, we're going to go and we're going to take over East Germany. That freaks out France and Britain in particular, particularly Thatcher, because she had the, you know, the sort of the, what I would call the, the red trousers and spitfire yes. approach to history, you know, which is the Germans will always be revanchist and come back again. So the French took this Euro idea out from the top of their in tray and they said to the Germans, look, you can have that East Germany place, right? But we're going to tie you to us. We're going to take your currency. Yes. So the trade was, you give us the Deutschmark, we'll give you East Germany. And that's where the Euro came about. And the Germans said, well, what are we going to replace the euro, the Deutschmark with? They said, oh, this thing called the euro. Right. And that's what happened. That was the trade. I mean, it's, it's so funny. That and they, so they weren't too happy about it, but they went along with it. They went along with it because they wanted yeah. East Germany. Yeah, of course. So yeah, it was all, yeah. it was, this was never said. It was all behind the scenes, you know. And of course, Gorbachev blessed the unification of Germany, which everyone thought the Russians would actually oppose. But Gorbachev blessed it because he had, he had this big worldview. Yeah. And the world changed completely. So there was all the politics of money is always fascinating. But you're right, the, the ruble zone would have been something they could have extended. But the problem was because the, cu the currency was never really benchmarked properly, the minute yeah. it was open, the ruble collapsed. But it would have made it stronger as well, because you would, would have, have had all the stands and then all of the Warsaw Pact countries and away you go. Yeah, but if a currency is fictitious and has been maintained by exchange controls and all that sort of stuff... Mm. Then I think it will fall. But you are you are right. I mean, the Russians the Russians could have done a lot more, ironically, with communism than they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but that's it. Absolute power corrupts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to be communist, that. do it properly. <laughs> exactly. But we're going to focus on Russia today. Go on. Yes, tell me. Because one of the fascinating things about Russia, when you go to Red Square, right? Yeah. A Red Square is monumental, right? And it has the Basilica of Saint Basil. With yeah, these onion, onion domes, right? Yeah, yeah. That's just right in front of you. Then you have the Kremlin, right? So you have the Russian government and then the Russian Orthodox Church there, the twin powers of Russia, yeah. right? And then you really feel it. But you also then have Lenin's mausoleum, where Lenin is just rotting there. Yeah. Right? He's been rotting there for years, <laughs> preserved, right? And then you have the Russian soldiers and you have the flame of the internal hero. And you really get a sense that you're deep in kind of the ground zero of Russian power. Yeah. But what really struck me when I was first there wasn't the ground zero of Russian power and the majesty and the, the strength and the muscularity of all, it was actually the faces of the people, the tourists, that they weren't Europeans, they were really Asiatic. And I'd forgotten that, you know, 
Russia is a multi-ethnic country with huge, huge Asiatic parts to it. Like yeah. massive Asiatic parts. Just Not just the stands which broke away, but also lots of other Russian republics that are very Asiatic. And that gets you thinking about the nature of Russia. And you think that Russia is a country which has got 100, 100 official languages. Does it? Yeah, it's a right. completely multi-ethnic country. Yeah. Yes, it is orthodox. That's the main religion. But it's also got about 20 million Muslims. Right? And what you might notice also, if you look at the reports of the war, a lot of the Russian soldiers who have been killed, again, very Asiatic looking, right? Or they're very, is, right. they're very dark looking and they're mainly Muslim kids from Dagestan, which is a big republic yeah. down the south, right? What you're finding is Russia is this extraordinary mix of people, right? So you have, for example, Russian Orthodox people believe that Moscow is the third Rome. That's what they call it. So the first Rome is Rome. The yeah. second Rome is Constantinople. Yeah. The third Rome is Moscow. Why? Because they believe that when Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, that Russia was the power that preserved the integrity of Eastern Christianity. Yes. Which is right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. But so they believe that completely. Then, of course, you have this huge Muslim population. You also have a very, very large Jewish population. You also have loads of Buddhists. Your friends, John. You have, loads of, you have loads of sort of ne Nepalese, Buddhist, yeah, chilled yeah, yeah. out, peaceful lovers. You also have the last great European pagan tribe called the Mari tribe. And there's about 600,000 people on the Volga River, right? Right, right. in central Russia. And they're pagans. They're right. complete. They're still practicing pagans. They're the last pagans in Europe. Right. Okay. And they're in the Volga. So, fascinating. So you've got all these types of people. And when you go to Russia, what you see is these various different faces and ethnicities yeah. and languages and cuisine and all the things that represent other cultures. But a lot of these groups spread right across eastern Russia. Yeah. Don't have the same Moscow worldview. No, they're really different. So, so what you have is then you've got the big part of Russia that we all know is Siberia. Yeah. But then you've got the Russian Far East on top of that, which yes, the Russians yeah. refer to as the Far East, which, right? right. So it's... The Vladivostok. Yeah, and it's enormous. It's enormous. And they grab little bits of uh, Japanese islands there after the, after the yeah, Second World War. Yeah, so, yeah. so the country is enormous. It's all these different time zones. But interestingly, and this is the point, is that where most of the wealth of Russia is, is in Siberia and the Arctic and the Russian Far East. 29% of all govern, government revenue, all government revenue comes from oil and gas alone, right? Almost all of the oil and gas is in Siberia or in the Arctic, yeah. okay? Much of their iron deposits are in the Kola Peninsula, in, si in Siberia, in the Far East, the copper deposits, again, beyond the Urals. The real wealth of Russia is not in European Russia, but it's in Asian Russia, right? right? Now, this is interesting in the context of what's happening to the Russian population. The Russian population is falling. All post-Soviet republics. Why? Oh, they're not having. They're not just not having kids. They're not it's having. It's as simple as that. Uh, and so it's immigration. Uh, massive brain drain. Yeah. They have a huge. In the nineties, they did really serious problem with premature male deaths from boozing, from alcohol. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. So the life expectancy in Russia collapsed in the nineteen nineties. It's recovering a bit, but hasn't recovered. Mm. But basically, what you see, interestingly, is that in reasonably middle-income or wealthy countries, a great sign of confidence in the future is children. One of the great leading indicators of confidence in the future is countries that reproduce themselves, right? right? And what you see in all post-Soviet countries, all of Eastern Europe and Russia, has been a collapse in the birth rate since the end of communism. And that is maybe because people gave up hope. People just thought, I'm not going to bring a child into this world. I, wow. can't, I can't afford it. So yeah. it's a really damning statistic. And what you see in Russia is the population of Russia was about 147 million at the end of the Soviet Union. It's now 145 million, so it's beginning to fall, right? And therefore, the demographics is the, much older. Yeah, so you've got a much older population. And that's why you're seeing, John, in the army, lots of Muslim boys dying, lots of Asiatic boys dying, because they're the only places where the populations are rising. So the younger population is in yeah. the republics 
that are largely Muslim are largely Asian. And they, their heart is not in the fight. Because they've, they've no beef with the Ukrainians. Yeah. Right? They've no beef. So it's, it's, it's tra- tragic when you see it. It's really yeah. tragic when you see it. But what I'm interested in is the following. Russia is a project of the Romanov dynasty, right? Mm. It's about a 250-year expansion from the Duchess, the du- what they call the Duchy of Muscovy, right around mm. Moscow, right? So starting with Peter the Great and probably ending with the czars of the last... 19th century. Yeah. With this great expansion east and a great expansion south. So they conquer the Tartars, they conquer the Cossacks, they conquer the Ukrainians, they conquer all the Asiatic tribes, okay? It's not that long ago, right? And if you look at what keeps Russia together, always kept Russia together, has been two issues. Patronage, as in power and money, yeah. from the center, and fear, and the, the military. Yeah. So basically what you have is you this idea of the strong government. Strong government always had money and it always had the military or the police, right? But now you look at Putin, right? Putin's very soon going to run out of hard currency. Particularly, we've been talking about energy. The Mm. aim of the West, the aim of the West is regime change in Russia. Don't let's in any way. Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. And what they're going to do, and I think it could be quite cynical, is they might prolong the war in Ukraine and tighten the sanctions. And that, I think, is a cynical, because in a way, if the war comes to a quick end, Putin survives. Yeah. If it doesn't come to a quick end, so never... And it's just a lesson they learned from Saddam Hussein as well. It's a lesson Cause they... Because there wasn't a regime change in the first Iraq In the first war. Gulf War, yeah. and they said, we're not doing that again. Yeah. Right, yeah. because yeah. George Bush's dad pulled back yeah. and said, let's keep him in power, let's leave him in power. And then they had to... Then they came back for seconds, yeah. 10 years later, right? So, but if you think about what's going on now, the Russian population is falling. It's growing in areas which have no real absolute link to Moscow. First of all, they are religiously and ethnically different, right? If Putin runs out of money, he's got no patronage. You can't keep paying off people. Now that the, for example, the army in Ukraine are being seen to be pretty mediocre, yeah. That fear that the people have, you know, you know, over time, nationalist fervor will wane, right? And people will start to go back to normal. And they'll start to go back to, well, hold on a second, we've got no hard currency, whatever. It strikes me that if you look at the expansion of Russia, there's nothing God-given about Russia's borders now, right? Nothing right, at all. okay. So think about Siberia. Yeah. Incredibly mineral-rich with everything, everything you'd want. Iron, gas, oil, everything, right? There are 30 million Russians of every hue in Siberia, right? right? Guarding that entire territory. There's a billion energy-hungry, mineral-hungry Chinese just underneath them. And they've been constantly worried in Russia before this about Chinese infiltration, Chinese migration up to Siberia. So is this why they did that kind of... or? came to that arrangement yeah. quite recently between Xi and, and Putin. Exactly that, because Putin is the weaker player here. Yeah. This is the no-limits friendship. Yes. Yeah. Because what the Russians are really afraid of, think about it, the Romanovs only took Siberia from the people who were there before. Yeah. And they only ended up taking, the last big expansion was in the 1860s. It's not that long ago. What's to stop the Chinese saying, you know, there's only 30 million Russians up there, there's a billion of well, us. Exactly. We need a little bit of living space, you know, and taking yeah. it. So what I'm saying is having now made international boundaries a joke by invading Ukraine. Yeah. So they used to be sacrosanct. Putin said, no, no, no. Maybe he should be looking over his own shoulder at his own international Ooh, boundaries. Geez. Because they have the longest borders, land borders, in all that area. Of course, yeah. With China. Yeah. You know? And, and ultimately, ultimately... You know, history, in the same way as the Romanovs expanded and the same way as Putin thought he'd take out Ukraine, history is about the use of force. And typically the use of force is about population. And if you're trying to protect a vast area that is really attractive with a tiny population as against an enemy with a huge population, you're going to lose. But it's also the fact that China's influence in the stands is enormous is well uh, but it's growing because of the the yeah, belt yeah, and road yeah. initiative 
So if they are smart as well, they'll start looking towards China as opposed to of course they towards will. Moscow. So and and again, many you know a lot of people have cultural links, yes. right? So I would say nineteen. You know Ezra Pound, John. Yes, he, I do. He Ezra Pound, the American poet, said that nineteen twenty two constituted the beginning of modernity, right? He said for a variety of reasons. We've talked about Joyce yeah. and Picasso yeah, and yeah. Mussolini's march on Rome. You have all sorts of changes in 1920s. It's the beginning of modernism in the artistic literary world, right? Yeah. And Pound said, right, this is the beginning of the modern world. What he went to was, this is the beginning of the 20th century. So the First World War was basically a legacy war of empires that had been actually formed in the 19th and 18th century, yes. right? Yeah, and he yeah. said, once this is over, we begin this new century, right? It could be that 1922 was the beginning of the 20th century and 2022 is the real beginning of the 21st century. And countries that were really strong and were really powerful end up disappearing or becoming much smaller. Yeah. And Russia could well be one of them. While I have you there, listen, I just want to say thank you so much to all our Patreons who really supported myself and John throughout the last nearly three years. Man. Three years, wow. Oh, it's a long time. I thought it only started last week. <laughs> it's such a good crack, though, isn't it? Is, it is, it is, it is. It's like, it's like having the dream gig. You know? <laughs> thank you very, very much. And if you do want to support us on Patreon, it's patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. You get ad-free, you get courses, you get chats, you can ask me questions, all sorts of stuff, and you really become part of the gang. So that's patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. And again, thank you very much. Thank you.